So we're here today on this podcast talking about Bhagavad Gita as it is by Srila Prabhupada. And we are honored to have as our guest speaker today, Yogeshwar Das, also known as Joshua Green. And a little introduction about Yogeshwar. He has a very accomplished uh, life, both in devotional service and in his uh, material world. He's a very successful person. Uh, originally, Yogeshwar was initiated by Prabhupada in 1970 in London, where he recorded with the London Temple on George Harrison's Radha Krishna Temple album. Yogeshwar received Brahminical initiation in 1972, and during 13 years of temple life, he served as temple president in Paris and later in Philadelphia, head of ISKCON's French publishing office, editor of Back to Godhead magazine, and founder of Bala Books Children's Publishing Office. Currently, he serves as mediator for ISKCON Resolve. Yogeshwar has also earned his master's degree in religious studies at Hofstra University, where he taught Holocaust studies and Hinduism from 2003 to 2013. His devotional writings include Here Comes the Sun, The Spiritual and Musical Journey of George Harrison, Gita, Wisdom, An Introduction to India's Essential Yoga Text, and Swami in a Strange Land, an ISKCON authorized biography of Srila Prabhupada. He is also a documentary filmmaker whose films about Holocaust history are seen on PBS and Discovery. And his biographies of Holocaust survivors have sold more than one half million copies worldwide. What a great resume. And uh, because he is uh, an author of this book, uh, Gita Wisdom, uh, he is a, an excellent guest to uh, talk about the Bhagavad Gita today. So thank you for joining us. My pleasure, Prabhu. Always wonderful to spend time with you. Jai. So a little history. I mean, we know each other, you know, not so close over the years, but we know each other uh, through our dealings within ISKCON, serving Srila Prabhupada and his movement and spreading the teachings of Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu and Krishna and the Bhagavad Gita, et cetera, and Srimad Bhagavatam. Um, but uh, a little history maybe of uh, a little relevance about your background that might lead us to and your understanding, our understanding of you and your realizations about the Bhagavad Gita based on your, your past, you, where you grew up, uh, maybe your parents, uh, what they were doing, your siblings, and what religious upbringing bringing did you have, if any? Mm -hmm. So take us back a little bit uh, prior to meeting Prabhupada and, the, and your introduction to the Gita. Well, I'm 71. I was born in 1950. Very much a product of my generation. Uh, went off to the University of Wisconsin in Madison. And in those days, we're talking 67, 68, students spent more time protesting the Vietnam War than they did attending classes. And um, I was rather disenchanted with the protest movement and thought, well, if I'm gonna do this university thing, at least let me get some travel out of it. So I transferred to New York University in Paris and attended the Sorbonne studying literature. And um, I guess uh, my introduction to Bhagavad Gita was while studying in Paris, attending uh, classes in French given by Umapati uh, at the American Center in the Latin Quarter on, uh, I think it was on Sundays. And uh, there was always fruit salad, prasadam. So in my, in my head, I'm always connecting the Bhagavad Gita with, uh, with fruit salad. Uh, and um, I, there might have been some contact with the Gita previously at um, the University of Wisconsin. There were philosophy classes and so on. But it didn't uh, make much an of an impression. I think the mm -hmm. English editions that were available in those days uh, were rather dry and academic. So I think truly the first contact would have been when uh, when I started attending those classes in Paris okay. in 1969. All right. Now, prior to that, growing up, let me get a little personal history background. Were you, uh, what religion did your parents uh, teach you and what was your, within the home prior to leaving the home for your university days? Well, 
technically my parents were Jewish, but they were uh, quite neutral when it came to religion. And in fact, I asked to be bar mitzvah when I was uh, a lad because uh, they had no plans for that. Uh, they were divorced also. My my mom and dad were divorced when they were when I was quite young, two years old or so. Mm -hmm. And um, and you lived with your mom or your dad? Lived with my mom. Grew up with my mom. Uh, she was my best buddy. We uh, we kind of grew up together. Really, she had me when she was twenty five. And uh -huh. okay, we lived in a two and a half room apartment in New York City. Um, with siblings? We were no, I was an only child. My dad okay. remarried. He had. Mm -hmm. um, three children by his second marriage, including my brother, Brian, who's a very well-known physicist. Okay. Um, but uh, like Brian's kids are not go go going to be bar or bat mitzvah because, uh, you know, we had the same father. And he described himself as a religious atheist. Your father did? Yeah. Okay. He, uh, he looked at the sadness of the world and was quite irate at the idea that there would be a deity, a supreme being who could intervene if he so chose to do so and chose not to. And for him, that was uh, a deal breaker. Mm -hmm. Were, well, being, so when they separated, when they divorced two, two and a half, when you were two, two and a half, did your mother uh, suggest that you go to synagogue or? Was no, it... I, I was, I was raised in um, ethical humanism. I went to the ethical culture schools, both uh, junior and senior high school. Um, in New York, the, the high school is called Fieldston. It's in the Bronx. Ethical culture is, I guess you might describe it as a non-theistic religion. It's a belief in humanity. It's a faith in the uh, potential of human beings to achieve goodness and uh, pursue their higher natures. And that was my, if you wanted to call it a religious background, that's about as close as it came. In that time, during that time growing up uh, within your mom's household, <clears throat> were you um, aware of God? Were you thinking, okay, is there a God? Is there not a God? Or were you just going along with the program with your uh, schooling? Yeah, no, I, I was, I pursued girls, not God. Okay. Um, I didn't do very well in either of those two callings, but um, there wasn't much discussion about it. Um, my mom was a career woman uh, in uh, public relations and communications. And, um, you know, in those days, we're talking mid to late 60s here, um, more attention was given to the energy around the peace movement, the anti-war movement. Um, I remember attending concerts and concerts, it was, you know, uh, gigs, uh, in Greenwich Village back in those days, um, mm -hmm. hearing uh, Jimi Hendrix before he was known as Jimi Hendrix, mm -hmm. um, Jose Feliciano, uh, who else did I hear there? Bob Dylan. Mm -hmm. you, know, you could just kind of drop into the clubs in those days and hear the greats. So that was more the scene. It wasn't a, a religious uh, orientation in any particular way. Right. So not having a, a a real foundation in religion or the study of God per se. How uh, did it affect you when you took the classes at the Sorbonne with Umapati? Was there uh, acceptance in that idea of a supreme being? Or? I honestly think that um, for many people, and I include myself here, not having a religious orientation is an advantage when it comes to contemplating uh, pursuing a life as a devotee. Um, religion as that term has been uh, devolving over mm -hmm. the last uh, hundred years or more mm -hmm. uh, is very often a, uh, a negative. And I, and I think that uh, many people like me came as a tabula rasa, you know, it's kind of a clean slate to Krishna consciousness. And so when, when we encountered Bhagavad Gita and Prabhupada's teachings, there wasn't any bias for or against. Mm -hmm. And uh, for me, it was um, 
a kind of an, an awakening, an epiphany to the idea that there was anything at all practical in a life devoted to some supreme being that just ha had not crossed my radar screen whatsoever mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. until uh, meeting Prabhupada's disciples and then afterwards Prabhupada. Mm -hmm. What well, about the Gita? <laughs> what struck you about the, the Gita itself then was meaningful? Well, before even getting an impression about the Gita, when on, uh, on the Christmas holiday break from the Sorbonne in December of 1969, I went to London and uh, walked into the Bury Place Temple, you know, the place that George Harrison had leased for the devotees. And uh, that first impression was seeing God and his girlfriend on the altar, and he's black. I thought, this is hip. This is, <laughs> this is really good. <laughs> this is cool. Right. So coming out of the peace movement and uh, finding a black God, and then he's got a girlfriend on top of it. Saying, I'm, I'm in. You know, this is good for me. Um, there was a, a sense also in those days, you have to recall, changing lifestyles was not such a big deal back then. We were already outrageous. You know, <laughs> we were already wearing uh, strange clothes and beads and uh, mm -hmm painting our faces and uh, you know, experimenting with uh, alternate kinds of um, paths. So moving into a temple as an experiment initially was it really wasn't that big a leap, mm -hmm. kind of what you did back then. Then over time, realizing, pardon the use of this expression, but I, I, I backed the right horse here. <laughs> I, 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 I picked the right, um, the right group to identify with because the more you learn the more you now now getting into the, into the bhagavad gita made sense because all around you every day you're seeing it in action mm -hmm. see i think the 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 difficulty with you know religion per se and i i have to tell you i, I don't consider myself a religious person okay. to this day i i've never been religious mm -hmm. but the issue has always been the disconnect between theory and practice between the ideals of faith cultures, wisdom traditions, and the lack of exemplars of those teachings. Now, it, you know, meeting Prabhupada and his disciples, immediately you're struck with the fact these people, they're, they're walking their talk. I think that's what George Harrison's um, initial impression was as well. Now that, boy, mm -hmm. these people, they're, this is the real deal here. You know? um, so that, that impressed me. That was, that was an early impression. Right. So you moved into the temple uh, on Berry Street at that time? Uh, December 26th, about two o'clock in the afternoon, 1969. I remember the time because they were serving lunch for Sean. You know, so the, my first image was walking down the stairs of that lovely little handcrafted temple. You know, Sham Sundar did such a beautiful job yes. building the, uh, the altar and all. Um, and here were all these... Uh, young people sitting around having a vegetarian lunch. Yamuna was there, you know, ladling out the vegetables and the rice and all. And I'm thinking, boy, this is, this is nice. Now, remember, I, I was an only child. Mm -hmm. I never had, at that time, brothers and sisters. Mm -hmm. After my father remarried, I had, you know, siblings. And he was kind of a ready-made family. So when you talk about someone coming to Krishna consciousness, what you, you, have, to, you have to specify... Something I've learned over the years is you can't generalize about why people come to Krishna consciousness. Mm -hmm. You have to specify. And, um, you know, some people come because they were disenchanted. Some people come because they were seeking for some higher truth. Some people seem to have stumbled into it. And you're the stumbler? I, I mean, <laughs> I've always been a stumbler. But uh, I think for me, it was more... From a psychological perspective, that um, you had a well, here's, family. This is a kind of family environment. Mm -hmm. Wonderful devotees, you know, the, the people who had come from uh, San Francisco. Marvelous. What what beautiful people they were. You know, I just mm -hmm. said, whatever they're into, I'm I'm gonna stay because I like this company. Got it. When did the um, teachings of the Gita? I'm sure that they had Gita class and uh, that. Um, 
then you maybe became, I'm assuming it became more absorbed in the actual philosophy then after you felt at home with these fellow members that um, what was the significant thing about the Gita that maybe, I don't know if you studied the Torah or maybe in school a little bit of, about the Bible. What, if not, if not at all, what about the Gita became significant after you did some studies? of the Gita itself, okay. Bhagavad Gita as it is? Uh, it's a good question. You're asking how, how did the Gita impress itself upon me? Yes. And I, I think the answer is over time. There was no immediate epiphany about the teachings of the Gita. I, I think it was, um, you know, it's like um, if you go to a museum and you look at a painting when you're young, let's say Picasso's Guernica or Monet's water lilies or whatever. Um, you have an, an impression when you're young and then as you grow, as you live life, as you mature, your appreciation for a work of art deepens. So the same work of art seen 20 years later can have a vastly different significance because you've changed, your life has changed. Mm -hmm. I think the same is true with the Bhagavad Gita. You have an initial impression of the Gita and that's, that's fine, that's wonderful. But as you continue and live life, the significance of what Krishna has provided here becomes much more uh, palpable, much more real. I'll give you an example. When I mm -hmm. first joined the temple, for me, uh, uh, karma and um, material attachments, look at there. Material attachments meant what? Basically sex, drugs, food, that was pretty much it. And, and rock and roll. I couldn't get rock and roll music out of my head. So that, that was it. That was, that's what attachment meant. I can understand now that um, karma, the things that bind us to this world, can be anything. It can be the pursuit of knowledge. It can be um, art and literature. Anything that's done with an aim toward self-aggrandizement, toward an enhancement of our life in this environment mm -hmm. is karmically loaded. Um, but I didn't know that then. Mm -hmm. so then it was a rather simple formula. This is right, this is wrong, this is good, this is bad. Um, if I've understood anything over the years, it's that Bhagavad Gita does not traffic in good and bad. Bhagavad Gita seeks to deepen our understanding of our life, of the world around us, of our relationships with others, and equip us with tools for better managing the challenges that come our way. Mm -hmm. So it's gradual, it's over mm -hmm. time. So it sounds like uh, you saw it as a really a non-sectarian book of teachings, practical uh, lessons, Mm -hmm. perhaps um, this is what I'm getting from what you're saying there that uh, yeah. that you can advance in your own within your own inner nature and your own consciousness by these particular teachings that are in the Gita it's helpful hearing you phrase that because it's it's um, a wording that I wouldn't have chosen myself I think to describe my relationship with Bhagavad Gita it would be to say First and foremost, always bearing in mind that it is about two people, Krishna and Arjuna, dear, dear friends from childhood, related by marriage. You know, Arjuna was married to Krishna's sister. And that there was a, a, a love relationship there that allowed this transmission of teachings to take place. I mean, that's, that's there in 18th chapter. You know, like Krishna comes right out and says it. I, 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 I'm teaching you these things because I love you, because you're my dear friend. And um, that always impressed me profoundly, the idea that um, enlightenment, you know, come to that highest stage of, of yogic achievement uh, is a matter uh, of the heart. Mm -hmm. it's, it's a matter of a uh, of caring 
of, of, of wanting to help, of compassion, boy, that, that made a lot of sense to me. Mm -hmm. um, otherwise, if, if you just take the Gita as, um, you know, you only have, there's two options here. Either, either the Gita is a myth, you know, the whole world of Krishna is, 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 is Hindu mythology. And then the, what is the Bhagavad Gita? Well, it's a vehicle for putting good teachings out into the world. And you don't have to worry about what's the relationship with, between Krishna and Arjuna, what is the dramatic structure of the text, it doesn't matter. It's just a vehicle, a convenient vehicle for putting good teachings out into society and maintaining the status quo or whatever. On the other hand, if you accept that these are real people, you know, Krishna is a real person, Arjuna is a real person, then we're obliged to approach the Gita with a very, very different uh, perspective. One of, from our own experience of what it's like to interact with people, mm -hmm. why are they speaking in this way? Why are they talking about this right now? And the way you read the verses is vastly different. If you accept that Krishna and Arjuna are real people and they love each other and they're having this discussion from that level of, of trust and intimacy, the Gita opens wide and it and, and becomes something very, very different from the way it's studied in a classroom. Mm -hmm. That's a good, a good explanation. How did it, uh, over the years then, studying it, obviously in your perspective, seeing that, uh, that they are real people, accepting that fact in, in, within that uh, realm of the uh, understanding of the Gita, Krishna actually instructing Arjuna as a friend, uh, to come to his senses and to, uh, to do his duty and not be bewildered by family attachments, etc. But personally, then over the years, how has that teachings of the Gita been a practical, positive, I'm assuming a positive uh, aspect, a positive book in your life? Ha have you been able to say, okay, well, this has helped me in this regard and, you know, peace of mind, happiness, what what has developed for you internally by the Gita? I'm going to give you an answer that you might not have been anticipating. I would say the Gita has given me more challenges and sometimes confusion, sometimes rude awakening to myself and my own behavior and the way I live my life, then moments of happiness and, and um, you know, good cheer. Mm -hmm. um, the Gita is a wake up call. And uh, if you allow yourself to embrace it as meant as a gesture of love, again, it comes back to that. If you understand Gita to be this gift, then it becomes uh, almost like talk therapy. I mean, it's, <laughs> there's this going deeper inside our nature, uh, our behavior, the way we are in the world, uh, in, in, a, in a way that is, I mean, I, I've consulted with psychiatrists and therapists over the years. I mean, the first thing I did when I left uh, 13 years of temple life was to find a psychiatrist. It's like, what was I thinking? <laughs> so, um, and so I can tell you from experience, having done some studies in this area, the Gita is an ideal study in human psychology, deeply penetrating study in why we behave the way we do. And sometimes what you come up with is tough. You know, you're really obligated to confront the kind of excuses you make for yourself or being in a particular way. Uh, it, it, it challenges you to go beyond what you think your limits are. I mean, there are just so many um, penetrating dimensions of that text that um, it's a daily companion. I, I don't think I ever get bored reading a verse. I can read a verse a hundred times and every, every time there's something new coming okay. out of it for me interesting what uh i don't know whether you want to delve into this but 
it comes to mind um, curious uh, thought as to after being a devotee in the temple, et cetera, full time, I assume, for 13 years, um, what impelled you to seek out a psychiatrist or a psychologist? What was that oh. internal thing that uh, said, I, I, I need some help? Well, I, I, first of all, I think it's common sense. I mean, we're, you know, this is Kali Yuga after all. You know, nobody has a pretty story to tell. And uh, very often, the, uh, the things that determine our behavior, the things that set our values, uh, the things that impede us from getting where we want to go are events that happen quite early in life. Mm. Um, you know, I, I feel qualified to talk about this because these are things I've discussed with Prabhupada. Okay. I, I, I'm, I'm fortunate in that way. You know, I, I spent a lot of time with him. And, and um, for whatever reason, I was rather brazen <laughs> in, in, uh, in questions that I asked him and things that we discussed one-on-one. -on -one. And um, what a great privilege that was for me. And those memories have sustained me over the years. I mean, I've been a devotee now for 53 years or whatever. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So more than a half century. And very often it's those discussions that I had with him that have kept me spiritually alive so and, what uh, uh, what conversation did you well, yeah, let's let's talk about what we're discussing here therapy you know i yeah. asked him one time what do you think of therapy what do you Go think ahead. of psychiatry and psychology and, uh -huh. and counseling he said well I, I i used it for one of my children i said i i had a son who uh, came back from college and he tapped his forehead like this as he wasn't right in the head and he said in those days the uh the, the, how the hospital in Calcutta had two wings. There was a British wing and a Hindu wing. And he said, I spent a lot more money to send my son to see a, a therapist in the, in the British wing. They said, I asked him, I said, that, I had no idea that that was even something that you would have considered doing it. Did, did it work? Or did you find it effective? He said, yes, for some time, uh, my son, got better mm. he, he was more his old self his normal self but then one day he said he left home and i never saw him again uh so he said i have qualified appreciation for therapy but he did not condemn it by any stretch i mean he really thought that you know it's like it's like a dentist you know you don't condemn dentistry because going to the dentist you don't come out self-realized i mean you go to the dentist to get your cavity filled so you know there are mental challenges as just as there are physical challenges and there's no uh shame or yeah, no blemish right. you're not diminished by going to find help when you need it right good but that's an example okay um let's get right down to the gita itself if you were to introduce the gita to a new person um, is there one that uh, one verse or two that uh, stick out that is significant that might attract someone to want to delve further themselves into the Gita itself that uh, is significant in your mind for you personally? Well, again, uh, hoping to practice what I preach, I think rather than generalizing, mm -hmm. you know, you have to get very specific here. And if you're talking to someone who really has absolutely no background in in um uh, the subject matter of uh, consciousness and the difference between uh, consciousness and 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 matter and so on. you'd probably want to start with second chapter I mean, you could go to 213 for example de hinos min yata de he that's that's an image that um almost anyone could be able to uh grasp you know, that you go from being a baby to being a child and then to a young person and then to uh, an adult and then to an old person. Uh, and you remember all these stages of your life. There's a continuity of, of awareness, of consciousness, despite the physical change. Mm -hmm. So death is yet one more change. Where does that consciousness go? So that's, that's a very good starting point for 
someone who doesn't have much background. I think if you were talking to someone who had some exposure to Bhagavad Gita, you might want to um, go deeper, dig deeper inside some of the verses. For, for example, I'll give you an example. This is from um, teaching many years in yoga studios where, we're, okay, good. where uh, the people attending think they understand the Bhagavad Gita. <laughs> they think they know mm -hmm. the Gita, but they don't. Okay, yeah. Um, and you so throw, say, you throw okay. them a curveball. Go ahead. Yes, exactly. You know, get them to think it, but gee, there's something more here. Uh, look at, uh, let's say, uh, 518, right? Vidya Vinaya Sampane Brahmani Gavihatha. A pundit, a, 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 a wise person, sees on an equal level you know, a cow, a Brahmin, as a wise person, um, an elephant, a dog, and a dog eater. Right? Now, why did Krishna choose those two? You know, there's millions of species, millions of examples he could have chosen. Why dog and dog eater? That was obviously intentional. So to my way of thinking, what he's telling Arjuna, and again, this is for application in the yoga studio, don't get so proud of yourself because you're a vegetarian. The real spiritual principle is seeing the equality of all beings and offering honor and respect no matter what a person's situation or background may be. That's your spiritual progress. Hmm. Prabhupada used to say pigeons are vegetarian, but they're not particularly spiritually evolved. So you can, you know, get inside it, you know, with, with someone. You can, you can go deeper inside a specific verse if someone's uh, ready for that. Did you, some, you saw some eyebrows go up in the yoga studio when... Uh... Eyebrows. You mentioned some. <laughs> Whenever we got around to um, the theistic side, you know, I mean, I'll never forget one class. This guy raised his. I'm starting to talk about Krishna and bhakti and so on. Uh -huh. His hand goes up, and I, I'm, I'm, I'm quoting here, dude. I'm just here for the stretch. This is really beginning to sound too much like religion, and he left, and I never saw him again. <laughs> you know, you never know. You know, but that that's the I think that's the dividing line right there when you're teaching Bhagavad Gita. As soon as if you're talking about karma and yoga and this and that, no problem. People are down with all that. As soon as you start talking about bhakti as the ultimate purpose of the Gita's teachings, that's when the room divides in half. Mm. They're the people who are willing to consider the notion that there's some higher force in the universe and that we have a relationship with that higher force. And there are others who are just not ready to discuss that. So again, you have to specify, you have to be prepared to take the temperature in the room and, and decide then where to go. You have to know your audience then. Yeah, yeah. Remaining sensitive to the notion that not too long ago, that was you sitting there. Mm -hmm. <laughs> You know, like in my case, I, if someone had started talking to me about God and love of God, and I just said, bye bye. You know, but it was uh, it was fun. You know, London in those days, 69, 70, it was just a blast. I mean, you got to remember, we were recording with George Harrison at Apple Studios. You know, what possible reason would I have for not staying? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> count me in. You know, it's uh. So, you know, the equivalent today may be that um, when people think about religion, they think about um, something that's been so misused, you know, the, the scandals of the church and child abuse and, and uh, misappropriation of funds and, and dogma and, and top down, you know, control of, it's, um, it's not a pretty picture. So, do need to be careful when you talk about Krishna consciousness to not inadvertently trigger those associations in people's minds. Right. Um, you brought up George Harrison. Um, from the time that you spent with him, were there discussions beyond um, 
putting the album together where you discuss philosophy or that oh, he would then all the, all the time he discuss putting those ideas of the Gita perhaps yeah, into he, verses he, into song all the time all the time George was um, a good example of an, a, a super intelligent person open to ideas that may not have been to his liking initially I mean you know George grew up in a in a in a family where uh, you know he would see the the, the priests in liver liverpool going from church to the pub across the street mm -hmm. and um just going around uh co making collections of money you know in in poor districts of, of the city so he was not particularly favorable to uh, the institutional side of religion when he met devotees, I mean, he was primed. You got to remember that also. He had been mm -hmm. to um, Maharishi's ashram in Rishikesh just, I think, about two months before he met Sham Sundar initially and then the others. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, had some intuition that there's something, there's something here. There, there's some meaning. When you live life like those lads did, you know, there wasn't an experience in the world they hadn't already had. And George was looking for something more. He once described his life as climbing to the top of a mountain and then peering over and seeing how much more there was on the other side. I remember being in, uh, was it uh, EMI? One of the recording studios, might have been Abbey Road, one of the recording studios for the Radha Krishna Temple album. I was sitting in the um, sound booth with him and said how's your spiritual life i mean he, we didn't know each other very well you know i mean he had, i wasn't a buddy the way sham sunder was but he took it very seriously he said well he says i'm having a problem with the whole guru thing mm. why do you think that is and again, he thought long and hard. And he says, it's, it must be me karma. <laughs> you know, he didn't have a, 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 a more of an answer than that at the time. Um, I think there was in his mind an issue around, can you really surrender yourself to a human being? Right. And after all, we're all souls in this world, you know. And um, so as much as the affection was there between him and Prabhupada, he had also had some rather unpleasant experiences with other gurus. Mm -hmm. So he admitted that, you know, he, he was right up front to talk about these things. That was his credit that he had that capacity to address tough issues in public. Well, I guess that really begs the question, did you speak words of wisdom to him or did you let it be? Uh, I oh. probably, spouted off some you know highfalutin uh, pontificating half truth that i had no idea what i was saying i mean i remember i was 19 years old at the time okay. we don't always make our most eloquent statements when we're 19. <laughs> all right good um well I, I just want to kind of wrap it up a little bit with um, a, a question that i ask everyone that's part of this podcast um the Bhagavad Gita that you studied as it is, were you able over time, obviously not, maybe not before you met the devotees and, and uh, studied the Bhagavad Gita as it is with him and with Prabhupada, uh, a difference between other authors, other teachers of the Bhagavad Gita who wrote different types of Bhagavad Gitas. In other words, why should one Sincerely, if, if one is interested in studying a Bhagavad Gita, why the Bhagavad Gita as it is, as opposed to others? Well, that kind of, you know, elevates the idea of a loaded question to a new height there. Um, I love me, Let me put it this way. I think everyone has his or her particular level of realization about the Gita's teachings. And uh, obviously, you want to be careful about not embracing uh, fallacious statements or commentaries. But um, 
there's a lot to be gained reading different editions of the Gita. There are environmental editions of the Bhagavad Gita. There's a, uh, an edition of the Bhagavad Gita that there are several that focus on social action. You know, the, the karma yoga angle on Bhagavad Gita. There are, um, there's a Bhagavad Gita for um, business people, <laughs> how to apply the teachings of the Gita in the workplace. And all of these different editions have a particular contribution to make. Obviously, I'm, I'm biased here. None of them has the spiritual depth of Prabhupada's edition um, because the authors didn't love Krishna the way Prabhupada loved Krishna. Mm -hmm. um, but I wouldn't be dismissive of, of, uh, of these other works. I think okay. our job, in fact, the, as devotees in the 21st century, is to go inside the experiences of our life, the, the opportunities that, that come our way, not just in different editions of the Gita, but in everything really, and, and find uh, the good. Um, I think when we were younger, when the movement was younger, there was this um, holier than thou kind of attitude. Yes. And um, we've matured past that now, or at least we should have. Good. That's great. What a great uh, realization. A very unique understanding of the Gita and the teachings and a, a great perspective. So I appreciate that. It's great. Uh, and uh, I want to thank you again for joining me and uh, on this podcast and uh, giving us your realizations about the Gita and so many other topics that we've uh, touched upon. And uh, I thank you. You're very kind to join me. Well, you know, Siddhanta, over the many years that we've known each other, I've always admired your dedication to exploring the lives of God brothers and God sisters and um, evoking from them gifts that through your channels, uh, you've been passing along to the wider public. And that's, a, that's a, a tremendously important and wonderful service that you're doing. So I thank you for including me in, in what you do. Well, uh, the feeling is mutual. And um, if I might say, without blowing smoke up your dhoti, I, I think you're one of the best authors within ISKCON, if not uh, a, a wider world of, uh, of authors. So, you know, you've been blessed and, and thank you for sharing your abilities. Truly. Thank you for, the, for your kind words. Okay. Have a great day, Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna.